up to a higher level now, a higher view, and we look at the actual interaction between the various muscle groups, what is termed intermuscular coordination. Again, this is a highly trainable part of the neural system. We're looking at the magnitude and timing of activation of the muscles involved in a movement. If you have a look at a, a movement which you might think is quite simple, a vertical jump, okay, it's not simple by any means. People spend their entire careers doing nothing else but trying to understand the counter movement jump. Because it's an extremely complex interaction between the agonists, so the muscles that are producing the movement, the synergists, or the muscles that actually contract and interact to improve, increase the efficiency of the agonists, and then of course the antagonists, the opposing muscles, which have to be switched off and relaxed at the appropriate time to optimise the performance. This of course produces increases in force and also the timing of the force because a lot of research has also been done on the power flow through the kinetic chain. You can have an athlete who's very, very strong, but when they perform a movement such as a triple extension, as it's called, such so as the hip, knee and ankle, you must have a highly coordinated and well-timed flow, and all the coaches in the audience know this, of the power output, the energy, down through the kinetic chain. Slight mistimings result in much lower vertical jump and takeoff velocity. The same thing applies for swinging a tennis racket or throwing a ball, putting the shot or throwing a javelin. The timing, the sequencing through the kinetic chain has a vast effect on the end velocity that you produce. Now, of course, we train this also. This can be learned by practicing the movement. So between the different muscle groups here, the coordination to produce the movement. We also must have coordination within the muscle, so intramuscular within the muscle. When we produce a movement, a very powerful movement such as a vertical jump or putting the shot, the brain just doesn't switch the muscles on. It doesn't go, oh, okay guys, let's go. All right? It coordinates it very precisely. And even within a single muscle, the way in which the brain actually switches the different motor units on and off is highly coordinated to produce the, the best performance. So how they're recruited, the motor units, their firing frequency, and also certain motor units within the single muscle will be disinhibited, they'll be switched off as well. Now this all sounds very, very complex, but this is something that we learn when we train. So when we, we lift weights, we then we then go out onto the court or onto the field and we practice our sport, our system then learns, our brain adapts and it does all this automatically. Okay. Short break for you guys. Are there any questions? Going okay? This is the really dry part of the day guys, I'm sorry. Um, this is the theory stuff. So. But we've got to do it. Okay, neural inhibition. Tied into all this is our system has anti-lock braking, it has dynamic stability control, and it has a rev limiter. Now, as you've guessed, I'm a bit of a rev head. What do you call people in Portugal? What do you call people who love cars? Driving cars. Probably can't tell me in English, hey? Uh, in, a, in the US, they call you a gearhead or a spanner. Um, but I like cars. I like Top Gear. Anyone seen Top Gear? Okay, great. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so modern cars have all of these systems to protect them. The human body does as well. So, when, for example, you are asking your body to exert more force than it is accustomed to. For example, if you jump down from a high height and you want to then get your muscles to contract, what will happen is 
the body will actually have sensors in the tendons. It will sense the amount of stress and it will clamp down the maximal activation of the muscle. That's the Golgi tendon organ reflex that many of you will be familiar with. It's a protective mechanism, otherwise you would be tearing tendons and muscles all over the place. So it's exactly the same as what you might think of a, a rev limiter on your car. Put your foot down flat, the revs will go up to a certain point, the computer will cut in and say, no more, I'm not, giving the, not, not producing any more, um, putting any more gas into the engine. The thing is, this is trainable. And once again, uh, Professor Goldhofer was one of the leaders in doing research uh, in this particular area. Uh, of how these regulatory mechanisms inhibit recruitment and discharge of motor units, in particular during very heavy eccentric muscle actions such as landing uh, from a high height. This inhibition causes reduced force through the Golgi tendon organ here. And we've got uh, Pierre Agard also has produced some nice work in this, uh, in this area. The interesting thing is through training we can switch the limiter off or we can dial it up so it's a little bit higher. So in your top gear, you know how they put it in sports mode? They take the Ferrari and they turn all the, um, all, the, all the computer controls off. Training an athlete, we can do similar things. If we train an athlete to drop down from a height and have these very heavy eccentric actions, we can actually set the rev limit at a higher point. Or in other words, we can set that reflex of the Golgi tendon organ at a higher point so the athlete doesn't shut their system down at uh, a certain force level, they can actually shut it down at a higher force level and they produce a better performance. So that's also highly trainable. There's also research which is still ongoing looking at motor unit synchronisation within a muscle. And this is getting fairly full on in terms of neurophysiology so I won't spend much time on it. But what we can see here is within a muscle we can have concurrent activation of motor units. Normally for all of us here, when we perform a heavy uh, movement, for example, if we were to um, do an overhead throw of a medicine ball, even during that movement, the body doesn't switch everything on at once. It cycles because as the motor units contract, they fatigue and we have to cycle through. So we rest some while others are firing. Once again, through training, there is some evidence that the athlete can learn to override that, can override that fail safe. It's a bit like turning the ABS off, anti lock braking. To switching that off so that all of the motor units in a given muscle can be switched on almost simultaneously. That produces much higher force and much faster rate of force development. But these are all learned adaptations in the system. Okay, so the development of training programs, and that's what we're going to lead into, that effectively enhance muscular power, must specifically target positive adaptation in all of these neuromuscular factors. We're dealing with an extremely complex system, very slight changes in training program design, and we haven't even talked about fatigue, because all these things change when the athlete is fatigued. All of these very minute changes all right, require highly specific training strategies and that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, let's have a look at modifications that we can produce. We're going to talk about strength training now. One of the easiest things for all of you to change in your athletes is their muscle cross-sectional area. It's fairly easy to do. You have them lift heavy things their muscle grows. You feed them correctly, you rest and recover them correctly. I hope that's not mine, it could be mine actually. It sounds like my phone. Uh, you rest and recover them correctly, you train them properly, your athlete will grow, whether they be male or female. So a whole range of different studies here. Uh, this particular one, these are from uh, a range of studies, including Bill Kramer's work. We see here the effect of strength training versus control, percent change after only eight weeks all right, so this is a relatively um, short cycle and what we see quite nicely here in the strength train versus control, we see increases in 
a fibre cross-sectional area in all three fibre types. No change for control. So strength training not only increases the cross-sectional area of your type 2 fibres, your fast fibres, but also increases cross-sectional area of type 1 fibres. Uh, this is data from 1983, famous study here uh, by uh, Hakkinen and Comey. Uh, we see this is the percentage changes after 16 weeks in strength training versus control. Uh, this is the average from rectus femoris, vastus lateralis and uh, medialis. And we see around a 15% increase in muscle cross-sectional area in 16 weeks. Um, sorry, start again. Someone should have pointed out I was, I was off waffling. Waffling? How does that translate? Um, I was off um, to speaking incorrectly. This is not cross-sectional area. This is uh, integrated EMG. This is muscle activation. My apologies. I got, see, I got excited. I started talking quickly. I started talking about something unrelated to what I was showing you. My apologies. Classic study from Hacken and Comey. Increased neural activation in as little as 16 weeks of heavy resistance training, they could actually increase the athlete's ability to stimulate the muscles. So this was the electrical activity measured. In this case, it was measured in the knee extensors. This is the control, no change. The strength train group increased their actual ability to switch their muscles on by 15%. So it is trainable. Well, it's a complex slide, I apologise. But what I'm trying to do is summarise here all of the studies which have shown the cross-sectional, uh, the effects of strength training on cross-sectional muscle area. And there's a large number of them here. You can see the different studies. What we're looking at here is the actual stronger versus uh, weaker athletes here in terms of the, their capacity. In different types of tests we see uh, squat 1RM, bench press here, squat, 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 etc. Here. And then we see the actual power output that they can produce. And again, we see that the stronger the athlete, the greater the power output they can produce in movements such as bench press throw or counter movement jump. Some um, other data here. This is, uh, this is data from our studies um, that we published in 2010. Uh, I'll go through this quickly because I've already shown you some of this. Looking at the cross-sectional relationship between squat strength and 40 metre sprint, we've already covered that here. Interesting comparison here between athletes that can squat more than 1.5 body weights in black versus uh, less than 1.5 body weights here. And then we see the relationship to sprint speed. The stronger athletes are faster. This is data from Jeff McBride's group um, in the US. Again, we see athletes that can squat uh, more than two body weights, 2.1 body weights, versus 1.9 body weights. Here, we see no difference in for five yard time. Apologise for the empirical units, but say five metres. 10 metre and 40 metre, significant difference here between the two. The stronger the athlete, the faster and more powerful they are. How are we going? Any questions? We've almost finished this section, so then we'll have a... I think we'll probably finish this and then we'll all stand up for a moment, because sitting down is really bad for you. And then we'll keep pushing ahead. Yes, sir. I train uh, sport combat athletes, uh, uh, mostly kickboxers and oh. jiu-jitsu players. Yes. And um, I have studied for some years ago a lot on the, the, the relation between the strength and power and the successful and the uh, performance. Mm -hmm. so, and in a technical uh, uh, discipline like uh, jiu-jitsu. There are uh, well-known uh, players well, that uh, prefer not to train uh, physical conditioning and strength, 
<coughs> they prefer to to train uh, the, the on specific uh, specific, uh, specific exercises in the tatami. Uh, so and they are successful as well. Yes. And they train uh, over uh, periods of time. I think rest and uh, activity. Activity and rest uh, periods, yes. so and that ratio, um, and they are successful as well, as the strength, uh, as, as the athletes who train strength <laughs> and and power. So, uh, in this in technical discipline, it's I, I'm here. Don't miss me wrong. I'm here because I believe that strength and power it's uh, it's beneficial and for for. But I, I'd like to know the official, uh, your opinion and in relation to what you're talking about, uh, about coordination and, yes. uh, and uh, the intramuscular uh, uh, coordination. Yes. Um, thank you. That is an excellent question. And I was hoping that someone would ask that. There are, as you all know, an extraordinary range of human qualities that go towards making a gold medal in the Olympics or the win winner of the European Football League. Uh, tactics, skill, motivation, psychological aspects. Uh, it is not just strength uh, and power. It's but, it's but one component. There will always, for the foreseeable future, there will be athletes who are the best and are successful um, without doing any such training uh, as this. They have other inherent abilities which allow them to be successful. For a lot of what we're covering here, that's okay for the number one, number two in the world. Okay? Uh, but we have to work with many, many athletes at many different levels. And as we'll see, in, a, in testing an athlete, if they are particularly weak in a certain component, and when I say weak, I don't mean strength weak, I mean they are low on a component, um, whether it be tactics or skill or, or strength, then that's, a, that's an opportunity. If we have an athlete who is relatively weak and not powerful, that is something that we can train and we can shift and improve fairly quickly. That should produce an overall improvement in performance. Okay? But the best athlete in the world, in their particular sport, is the best athlete in the world. And additional strength training may or may not make them better. Okay? But for the other 99% of the athletes that we have to work with, okay, a lot of these techniques will produce improvements for them. As we'll see also, strength training is not about, purely about performance. It is also a lot, and we'll talk a lot today, on resilience. Because it's not just performance, it's how long we can keep the athlete injury free and keep them performing. If the athlete is weak, then they are much more likely to be damaged. Um, we are much more likely to break them. An athlete who is strong is more resilient. An athlete who is strong can tolerate more on the field training. So it's not just about the absolute performance that we're talking today. But your point is very good. There is a, a, a lot of athletes who have had enormous success without a program, without ever lifting weights or doing power type training uh, at all. That will become less and less because as a sport gets to higher and higher and higher levels and the demands on our athletes are greater, then those athletes will break. And so even a modest amount of strength training will help them. This afternoon we'll talk a lot about testosterone and other hormones. It's very important in our athletes to maintain an anabolic environment. An athlete that only practices and only competes will, will rapidly move into a catabolic environment. And the only way to reverse that is through very targeted resistance training to lift growth hormone and testosterone in particular. Uh, and we'll see that those hormones are critical for maintaining the integrity uh, of the system. So those hormones drive connective tissue, in particular muscle and tendon and bone. And in, in our experience, what we're seeing now is a larger number of athletes who break easily 
Their, their performance is very good, but they're very fragile. Uh, much more fragile than we would have had maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Um, I work a lot in elite football, and we're seeing stress fractures. I mean, stress fra you know, multiple stress fractures in football athletes. You wouldn't, you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't hear of it. It just wouldn't happen. Because kids were playing on the streets, they were um, jumping off trees and running around all over the place. Now we have them playing on beautiful artificial turf surfaces and they, they don't do any other activities. Okay? And we're getting, as we'll see, we're getting athletes coming to us now. Their bone density is no different to a sedentary male, a sedentary man of the same age. For an elite athlete, that's a problem because they're going to break. Um, so I think there's other, other purposes for strength training other than pure performance. It's, it's also a lot about maintenance of the machine. But that's an excellent question and one which comes up frequently. Thank you. Can I? Yes. Uh, just the bottom, uh, I just, uh, uh, hang, well, hang on. For the interpreter. OK. We see in these graphics there are a good correlation in the strength and velocity. Now, that, that for that, if you're training with speed, and usually the, art, the, the arts of combat, they are speed, yes. you always train the strength. If you do a quick movement, you, you are more strength in that muscle. If the, you, you told you before, there are good relations in the, relation in the strength and speed. Mm -hmm. If you train speed, you make it stronger. Uh, I'm the right, or what do you think? At a very not the, 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 the top of the, the characteristics, it's not the top, but okay. there are some inter in relationship in between both. The adaptations in the neuromuscular system are highly specific to the stimulus, in other words, the way in which we train. There are certain, for example, to increase cross-sectional area, it can't be effectively done through high-velocity movement. High-velocity movement will, in will cause increases in muscle length, it will produce improvements in the neural system's ability to switch the muscle on. Research again by Hakkinen has shown that it does not increase maximal activation and it doesn't produce appreciable increases in muscle size. So different types of training produce dif different outcomes. And for a, uh, my background is also in martial arts, mightn't look like it now um, in my middle 50s, but that, that was my background in karate and uh, taekwondo. And even in a martial arts sport, which is highly technical and, and speed is, is critical, uh, to maintain muscle size, it requires hypertrophy type training. And we have to, have to train with higher volumes and with lower loads to actually, and we'll talk about hypertrophy this afternoon and how to train. Um, but that is entirely different training to what you would think of for the martial arts. But to grow muscle, to stimulate it, that's the way uh, bodybuilders train and we use those sort of techniques. Would you do that type of training close to competition? No. No, that's why we periodise our training so that we can put on size at certain, certain phases and then we can shift that towards increasing strength and then towards increasing speed. I'll give you just one example. If you train heavy, a, a fellow from our lab by the name of Tony Blazovich, a very nice researcher in biomechanics, what he showed, he did his PhD with me, and what uh, he showed was that heavy resistance training increased pronation angle. That's great for force generation, it's bad for moving fast. And what he found was that in as little as four weeks, he could increase the pronation angle and make the cross-sectional area larger. We then shifted the athletes to training low load and high speed. What happened was the pronation angle decreased Fascicle length got longer, but there was only slight reduction in cross-sectional area. That's why we periodise our training. Okay, we build a foundation, and then we move on to the next phase to build on that foundation. We build the bottom story, then we build the second story on top, on top of that. So your point's very well taken, but uh, we have highly specific training at specific points in time to achieve the adaptation that we need. How are we going for time? Time out. Coffee break? I haven't even finished the first lecture. <laughs> You're kidding. Sorry, we're going too slow. That's all right.
We're having fun. That's the main thing. Is everyone having fun? Uh, so have we any other questions? Otherwise, can I just finish this? Can I just finish this? Sorry, and then we'll go for coffee. Um, okay. A strength training. These are some longitudinal studies. This is a study from back 2002 by Widrick and Group. Here, what we're looking at again is the changes in cross-sectional area, maximum force, and maximum power of individual muscle fibres. Now, it wasn't so long ago when I did physiology that we were told that if you did strength training, you only shifted your fast fibres. If you did endurance training, you only shifted your slow fibres. <laughs> That's not the case. Okay, we now know better than that. This is strength training here. We're seeing we're shifting all of these fibre types quite markedly. This is type 1 here. Similar improvements in cross-sectional area regardless of fibre type and similar improvements in terms of force max here and also power output, particularly for type 2A. So we can shift the fibre type areas. Once again, this is training intensity. comes back to your question there. This is training at 100% of force maximum, so maximum isometric, training the fibres here versus training at 60%. And we see that we get a superior improvement in force max, only 10% in maximum velocity, but still an improvement. Training at 60%, we only get a 16% increase in force max and a 14% in Vmax. The exact same improvement in power. We get to the same endpoint in terms of power output, but from two different avenues. That's how specific training is. And I think we're just about to the, uh, the last couple of slides, and then we'll have a, a cup of coffee. Uh, this particular, another nice study here, this is looking at strength training. This is changes in 1RM. This is changes in power here. A key point here is if you increase your strength by 40%, you will not increase your power by 40% with strength training. It will be a lower percentage of that, it will be a lower proportion, okay, and there's reasons for that. Uh, this is uh, further data here on strength training. Once again, strength increased by around 30%, power only increased by about 17%. So don't expect the same transfer of strength training to actual power capacity. Data from our group here, similar effect here for strength training, power versus strength here. And then Jerry Mayhew's group as well. Although they got uh, much more comparable improvements, but this is for upper body. There's reasons for that because uh, upper body strength and power is not as well developed in most of our athletes. So it's interesting, lower body, we don't get the same transfer, upper body, great transfer. The simple reason is that we're looking at a less developed system for upper body power. Okay, so strength training increases power. The neuromuscular factors affecting that power production are improved through strength training. So at a very basic level, if we just do strength training with our athletes, particularly if they have a low background in strength training, that alone will increase, produce marked improvements in their power output. So there you go for a very basic take-home point from today. Regardless of your athlete, I don't care what sport it is, gymnastics, synchronised swimming, Billiards, doesn't matter. Just a basic strength training program has the potential to improve their performance. So thanks very much for your morning session. You've been fantastic. Uh, we're going to have a cup of coffee and then uh, we'll come back for the next, next part. Thank you.